Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I first of all want to welcome all of you to the University of Central Asia and uh, to thank you in coming in such large numbers on a kind of a dismal day uh, and for your continued support of our public lecture series. It's not very often that we have someone, uh, a guest speaker of the caliber and experience of Andrew Tikaj. And so I hope that you will take full advantage of his presence here uh, in the Q&A session as well as during refreshments later on so that you can personally uh, meet him, talk to him, exchange cards. Uh, he is looking to meet you, he's very uh, keen to meet you. So if you do have your business cards, keep it ready for him and uh, uh, we will take it from there. Andrew is no stranger to uh, AKDN. He has been associated with AKDN for many years he, at the Aga Khan University. Uh, he was uh, the director there for the, uh, of the environmental reporting program at the School of Media and Communications in Nairobi, in Kenya. Uh, so, and now he is here, and I will talk a little bit about, about uh, the reason why he's in Bishkek. He's been in the broadcasting business for 25 years, working for CNN, 60 Minutes, producing news and documentaries for them. And during this process, he has won eight Emmy Awards, which is, as you know, no small accomplishment. Um, and uh, he is now currently the director of his own company. It's called Messy Moment Media. And he'll probably talk a little bit more about that. He has a master's in journalism from Columbia University, which also happens to be my alma mater, so that's nice. Um, on Sunday, he will be going to our uh, university campus in Narin, where he will be conducting workshops for the students of our media and communications uh, major, which happens to be in Narin itself. Um, and uh, they, all our students are very excited to have him there all this time. If from between seven and 10 days, he will spend there. So I think they're very fortunate to have someone like him to go there and to give them this kind of training there. Today's program, we are screening two of his documentaries and Andrew will introduce each one of them before we screen it. Um, so we'll screen the first one, and then we'll have a Q&A session on that particular documentary, then the second one. So if you have general questions for him, I would request that you please hold it until both documentaries have been screened, and then you can ask him about that. Afterwards, we have arranged some refreshments and over, over a cup of tea uh, and some pastries. Perhaps you could then meet him and, and have a little bit more of a dialogue. So please join me in welcoming Andrew Tikaj. So thank you all for coming. And the one advantage I have as a filmmaker, it's very much a show and tell. I don't have to stand here and talk for uh, two hours, but I can actually entertain you with some film. So uh, the first uh, issue that I want to explore is to, for you to think before we look at these films is, you know, what is a documentary? What makes it different from a uh, feature film? What makes it different from news reporting? And, and then we can talk about, you know, and that analyze it in, in detail, right? And one thing to remember, documentary is very much a nonfiction movie. That's what distinguishes it. It's not um, just a longer news report, as many people would assume. It's not a, a lecture with pictures. It's actually using the same structure that you know, any narrative film would use, you know, which is having character, having development uh, of that character, having uh, going through, engaging people through some kind of a dramatic progression, um, and then having it resolved you know, to the satisfaction of the viewer, and at the same time giving a, a vision of the director of what the topic is. And in this film, which is called On Thin Ice, it's a half hour film that I made in Greenland with just me and one cameraman for 10 days. We were on a, a trip or expedition really from the northernmost settlement in Greenland. The last one where traditional hunters were still using traditional methods, uh, using dog sleds. But as we could see because of climate change, uh, their world was coming to an end. So it's an exploration of both the human story um, and the you know, bigger story of climate change. 
the other thing I want you to uh, be aware of as you're watching the film is it's got a very much a, a classical three-part structure. And all documentaries, all stories, all novels, you know, really since the time of Aristotle use the same structure, which is first to, um, you know, engage audiences by setting up the characters and setting up the theme, then taking the story through a development towards some kind of a uh, rising tension. And then in part three, where all these uh, issues are resolved to the satisfaction of the viewer and the story itself. So I think the, I won't speak much more now about this film because it's very much self-explanatory. And if you can kill the house lights, uh, we can look at this film, which is called Unthin Eyes. sea ice by dog sled which has experienced something extraordinary everywhere you look it is white you may as well be on another planet it was amazing for me to go back i rediscovered this extraordinary place which is it's another world really The world Stephen Leonard is revisiting is in Connacht, Greenland. Out on the sea ice, snowmobiles are still banned, and in town, the silence is only broken by the howl of dogs. Connacht is so far north, Admiral Perry launches expeditions to the North Pole from here, guided by the same indigenous hunters whose relatives still live here. They have the skills to navigate through water so cold it could kill in minutes. For a year, Leonard endured the world's toughest climate, studying the Inukwe's language and unique ways of communicating. Here, Anne Sophie is trying to teach me a few basics. I'm not a very good pupil. What does see man nai? Again. Now his old friends will take him back to a magical place that's literally disappearing. You've lived with them. Mm. You know them in a way that most Westerners, people outside of their communities, don't know them. What is happening? Well, most fundamentally, the sea ice is melting, and it's melting very fast, faster than they've ever known before. Now, what the melting of the ice means for this community is that it's becoming harder and harder to hunt. And what we're seeing in Northwest Greenland is a culture really very much under threat because of climate change. Cannibal. Climate change is a bread and butter issue here. Because Kanak's frozen fjord is the hunter's main highway to fresh food. Tell me about the hunt. Okay, so it's a team of four hunters. Masola, Christian, Aviak, and Naiminichok. <laughs> you say their names very well. <laughs> All unpronounceable names. <laughs> as, well, as a linguist, <laughs> you better say them well. <laughs> Aviak Peterson, he's a hunter in his 40s. The dog is really incredibly important to their culture. Then we have a uh, Christian Ipa, who's quite a character. He has remarkable knowledge, and he's he's gone uh, way up north. 
Then we have uh, Mas Ola Christiansen. Um, he's been hunting all of his life. And finally, nine minute Chok Peterson, who has been hunting for thirty five years. He came along with his grandson, William, who's just 11. And was a very impressive driver of dog sledge. It's a critical skill Namanachuk wants to pass on to his grandson. Clearly, if one is going to be on the ice in that region, you're going to be very glad to have any one of these men by your side. Describe their knowledge. It's intricate, uh, it's complex. They live very close to nature, um, and this is summed up in, in the concept called healer, which is the word for mind, consciousness, but also weather and climate. I think for them, climate change is actually a philosophical problem in the sense that they feel that the rest of the world has become too detached from nature. Of course, there's lots of different um, words for different types of snow and ice. Snow, which is sometimes very, it looks very hard on the surface, but it's very, actually very thick, so you can sort of sink down into it. Uh, that's called the mango nakto. I was often told that uh, you couldn't live uh, for long term in that part of the world without knowing their language. They need to survive. That kind of knowledge, which is encoded in language, is actually really useful uh, in, in such a hostile environment. But centuries of accumulated knowledge can't explain what's happening in the Arctic today. And in May, the open sea in front of us would normally be frozen solid up to the furthest islands, the area's best hunting ground. Now 
When the world becomes unrecognizable, the hunters are forced to turn it on its head. They've hitched dog teams to drag motorboats out to the open water. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit surprised because you see the it's getting closer to our village. The future makes it a bit more uncertain for the hunters. They don't know how to react. It's a real struggle even for the powerful Greenland dogs. They've been tied to Arctic hunters for 5,000 years on their long march from Siberia to Greenland. These hunters have big dog teams. Um, they are incredible animals. They are very powerful. One dog can pull sort of 70 or 80 kilos, but they need a lot of food. Um, and that food is becoming increasingly hard to come by. Okay. <laughs> Working with his dog team, Aviak strains to pull their skiff up the final hill. <laughs> but he still needs more dog power. A second team is brought up and lashed in. One more task awaits the hunters. Drop in their boat at midnight when the tide is at its highest. Now the hunters can set up their camp on the ice foot, the last precarious shelf of sea ice clinging to the mainland. The hardy dogs always sleep on the ice, but they'll be sleeping hungry tonight. <laughs> but it's no laughing matter. If the dogs aren't fed, they won't have the strength to make it back home. Survival depends on the success of tomorrow's hunt. <laughs> It's morning where the summer sun never sets, 700 miles north of the Arctic Circle. William collects the thousand-year-old glacial ice while his grandpa cooks up fresh walrus meat caught by other hunters. That's what is our life about. We, we have to catch our food from the nature. It gives us pleasure, you know. Happiness. Without that, there are no people up here. And without dogs, there would be no hunting. They have to catch something to feed the dogs. You have to prioritize the dogs. Masoli will lead today's hunt. He's leaving his dogs behind, but hopefully not for good.
Traditionally, the dogs led the hunters to the seals' breathing holes. Finding them in open water is a lot more difficult. This is where walrus and seals would usually bask in the sun, but not today. Finally, one of the hunters spots a large bearded seal. And the chase is on. People watching this are going to be shocked, some of them, that these indigenous people are hunting for seal. I'm an animal lover. I don't like to see animals being killed. It's not something I enjoy at all. What I would say is, the very small number of hunters, between 50 and 60 hunters have a full-time license. They live in an area the size of Germany. Even if they were out hunting every day, they, I think the impact on, on wildlife would be fairly minimal. Masole doesn't want to waste the precious catch. He must spear the massive seal with a hand-thrown harpoon before it sinks to the bottom. These are people who live you know, in harmony with nature and they're interested in going out hunting to get what they need. It is a subsistence mindset and then they will return to the town or the assessment with the food for their families and that's it. Relieved they can feed their dogs, the hunters pull into an Arctic ghost town called Kekatakwak. When the supply ship stopped coming, the old hunting post was quickly abandoned. It's an ominous sign of their future, but a convenient place to divide up their kill. If they choose not to live the subsistence lifestyle, then they still need to eat. And where does the food come from? It comes in the form of processed food, primarily on a supply ship from Denmark. And if you think about all the CO2 emissions from that shipping route, frankly, it's not worth it. It's, it's better to let them just, just live the way they've always lived. But how long will that be possible? The temperature in the Arctic is rising at double the world's speed. <laughs> you look around these remote settlements in northwest Greenland and you ask young people what they want to do with their lives. It's almost impossible to find anyone that wants to become a hunter. Back on the other side of the sound, the dogs pick up the smell of success. <laughs> Namanichuk stands by his grandson, teaching him how to feed the ravenous dogs. But he knows William will need other skills to navigate the future. <laughs> If they don't hunt, what do they do? The prospects look so dire with climate change accelerating and the sea ice disappearing. Um, it's difficult to know what plan B is really. In this unforgiving wilderness, everyone has to have an escape plan. Especially when a sudden spring thaw threatens to sweep the hunter's equipment out to sea.
It's the last day of the hunt, and this is as far as the Kanak hunters can go. Broken sea ice has blocked the way to where they suspect the animals have gathered. Impossible to reach by dog sleds and too dangerous and expensive for their small boats. We were out there for five days. We didn't see a single walrus. Polar bear. We saw one bearded seal. And the reason for that is that the sea mammals are retreating with the sea ice. The hunters were surprised, perhaps even shocked, by the, the fact that there seemed to be very few animals in the region. And there were more shocks to come. On the way back to their campsite, the hunters are forced to maneuver through a shifting maze of ice. Back on the ice foot, they have to spring into action. A strong tide is sweeping everything in its way. <laughs> Suddenly the shape and face of everything is changing before their own eyes. You are studying a culture that is dying. I think the Inahui are, are living at the end of an age. I think what will happen is that the Inahui will be, will be forced ultimately to give up uh, hunting by dog sledge. And of course that means that a lot of these dogs will have to be killed. And that's a sad story that we've seen up and down the west coast of Greenland over the last five or ten years. But don't tell that to the Kanak hunters. That's certainly what Masuli wants to believe as he gets closer to home and his family. Masule is returning home empty-handed, but in today's world, that's not a crisis. It's rather difficult to find one family now in northwest Greenland which is living from hunting alone. So often what has happened is that the wife has gone out to work in a school or in the community hall or perhaps even the small hospital and the man will still go out and hunt. Although this hunt wasn't successful, there is still good news at home. Masule's lead dogs have given birth to six puppies. They will be the next generation to carry on the dog sledding tradition. Naminichuk, like all the hunters, is painfully aware that his fate is no longer in his hands. Uh, 
all Namanitcha can do is share some of the life lessons he's learned with his grandson. No one could have predicted that this would be one of Namanitchuk's last hunts. A month after guiding his grandson home, he died from a sudden illness. If this way of life is lost, what is a loss to the world? I think their message is, you know, uh, the, the, the clock is ticking. Wake up, world. <laughs> Look at what is happening. If the Greenland ice sheet behind you melts one day, then we know that sea levels will rise seven meters. That means that London, New York, Netherlands, whole countries are underwater. This community is the cultural canary in the coal mine. Climate change is not going to affect this one remote community in northwest Greenland. It will affect the entire planet. So if you have immediate questions, I can, you know, because sometimes people are burning to ask something after they've seen it. Otherwise, I'll, I'll kind of talk about the structure of this film and ask questions myself of the audience. So um, does anybody uh, have any immediate question about this particular film, how it was done, anything? I th think it was uh, about four years ago. Yeah. Anybody else? The way, it, the way it happened was basically, um, I was sent there to produce uh, for Ann Curry, if you remember, she's you know NBC correspondent before the whole uh, blow up she had with uh, infamous anchor now. And um, this was an hour for NBC about severe weather changes already, you know, happening. And um, I said, well, look, I, I know this great side story but, you know, if you send us up there, you know, we might not come back, you know, for a month because there's only one plane every two weeks to Kanak. And if, it, if there's bad weather, there's not going to be another one for two weeks, right? And uh, they're not going to send, like, their anchor reporter to a place that she may disappear for a month, right? So that was out of the question. So instead, uh, I said, look, just, just let me take the cameraman because I had already set up... Uh, both stories. I had been in touch with uh, the scientist for about a year because he was doing a, a blog about his experience in this village. And, and we had worked out like, okay, if you come in the perfect time in May, it'll be the most dangerous, the time when the ice is really melting, you know, all these factors, you know, had to work out perfectly. And also the weather has to be sunny because you can't film climate change when there's blowing snow and it could easily be blowing snow in May. Um, and, um, then it was basically uh, me and a cameraman. Uh, I had, you know, my own DSLR, and we had we just went on two different sleds so we can shoot, you know, one to each other, um, and that was that. And you know, I was doing the sound. So that was then I put it together as a half hour for the NBC Web uh, series, basically. Now, anybody have any uh, other questions? So. Um, I'm going to ask then a couple of questions, okay? The first one is uh, every documentary, as I mentioned, there is a, a you have to set the, the scene, set the stage, right? So can, can and, and there is, you know, in this film we do it, you know, very carefully, both in terms of uh, visually and in terms of, um, you know, thematically, right? So what does anybody remember? How did we, 
set up the main story? What is the main story? Uh, and how did we set it up? How did we set up the characters, for instance? Because these are the kind of things that I have to you know, talk to if I'm working with young filmmaker students to try to be conscious of structure you know, before you start shooting. You know, the tendency is just to go out and spray the camera you know, uh, and collect as much as possible. But you always have to have a plan, right? And the plan has to be based on research that you do ahead of time, right? So does anybody want to uh, take a crack? How, how were, first of all, what is, what is the, the larger theme of the documentary? And what is the smaller theme? There's always two stories, right? One is the issue you're going to cover, and one is the story of the people that you're seeing, right? So does anybody want to take a crack at how did, uh, what are the two themes, first of all? Anybody have an idea? Take a, take a guess. It's not, it's not a, uh, excuse me? Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna, should I just point to somebody or give you the answer? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, that's very good. So basically, every documentary to have some kind of resonance, it has to have a bigger story, right? I mean, we're not doing home movies, basically. You know, we're, we're touching on something that's important for society, right? And that's climate change, of course. Um, but if we stand and, and preach about climate change, we can do that until we turn blue and nobody's going to care. You know, first of all, you've, seen, you've heard the word too many times by now. Five years ago, it wasn't so common. Uh, but, um, you know, you, you basically are following a human story, right? Um, and that is what is central to doing your research, right? You you're basically have to do a casting call for, for main characters, right? That fit into the, the larger theme. So that's number one, right? Okay, now in this story, we, we, you know, very often I usually look for one character, you know, stories and, you know, we'll see other films and we can talk about that. But in this case, you know, how many characters are there and how did we set them up? Or why did we set them up in the way we did? Does anybody want to take a guess? Yes. And the second is uh, not uh, a character, but a group of characters. Yes. Four hunters who get together when resources and physical things. Uh, yes. So, again, that. And then there are the dogs. Yes. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, the dogs are very important in this case, of course, you know. So, um, in terms of the, the researcher, you know, he is there in the way as a character because he told me about the story and he's the one that got us there. But he's also like a surrogate narrator, you know, like he has a picture removed from the scene, right? And it's very effective to find always like a voice like that because it allows you then to have less narration. The less narration, the less, you, know, the less you put people to sleep. You know, that was the old style of documentaries where people would write a script and then go out and film the pictures, you know, to, to foot, put in the script. But that was like, you know, 1950s BBC kind of documentaries. And they're great to watch, but as you can tell, you, you don't even know probably when I mean, you're watching why it feels so archaic, but that's the main reason. Um, so how, how did we set up these characters? Um, you know, the reason, so when I first met them, I, I said, well, I was looking for one character, you know, the hunter, the main hunter. But when I sat outside there, you know, with, with them the first day, I thought, well, they're all interesting and they all have different aspects to the story, right? And the main thing is we have to set them up from the beginning 
And then you, you don't have to, again, even mention your name because you'll know who they are and, and what role they're playing, right? So if, uh, does anybody want to take a, a crack at, you know, what are the different roles these, these four characters are playing in the film and how we visually introduce them? Anybody want to take a crack? It's a little bit more complicated as the questions go on, but I can fill in the answer if nobody wants to take a guess. I know it's not a film class, but anybody take a guess? That's the hunter, yeah, the main hunter. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's you've you've probably heard the 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 myth, and it's not a myth that they have 110 words for snow, and it's true. So um, when when uh, uh, Matsole, his name was, I think, um, he mentions the one word for the thin water that extends over, uh, you know, thin ice that extends over water that is equivalent to quicksand, you know, in Africa. If you step on that, you're dead, you know, because you go in the water and if there's nobody around, you're going to die, you know. So there's very specific reasons for this. Um, and I felt that, you know, initially, the reason this didn't go on network TV is be one of the reasons was because I let them speak in their native language, right? But that's why I, I was happy to do that. That's why it went on the web. And I, I'm more happy that it went on the web than to have done like a compressed two minute version or five minute version, you know? Um, but in terms of setup, um, if you think the story begins with them departing, right? And it has to have a logical order, a logical sequence, right? So um, each hunter, uh, you know, so later when we came back from the expedition, the reporter met us and I could give her the name. I said, look, you have to ask the scientists, tell me, he has to say out loud each one of their names and a, and a little description of each one. Because I was already thinking that I want her to introduce them naturally, not me with narration or some kind of a font or something more kind of uh, brute, you know, introduce them. So there's a Q and A that happens and he says their name, right? Each one. Um, at the same time, um, when I was out in the field, you know, I did interviews with each one of the four characters and I just selected, you know, one sound bite from each one that sort of defined their place in the story. So obviously for the hunter, it's, you know, the respect for the tradition of hunting, the, the, the meaning of, you know, culture and, and tradition in knowing the environment. Um, but other hunt, you know, each one has to have a slightly different role. There's one who, you know, basically is a joker, right? And why is he there? Anybody take a guess on that? You know, because you can't just be like dark emotions all the time, right? So even if you're talking about uh, climate change, you have to have positive and negative emotion, you know? So that, you know, like the film can go up and down, up and down, and he breaks that kind of solemnity. So whenever you have humor, uh, you really, it's hard to work it in, but you really have to bend backwards to do it, right? And I, I, I could see in this room, everybody laughed. So that was a good, good sign, right? Um, then we have the grandfather. So anybody want to take a guess? Why, why did we have him as a character? What role is he playing? Well, he's a bear magician. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so very much, you know, as soon as I found out his grandson is going on, on the hunt, um, you know, I was very happy to hear that. You know, I didn't know everything that was going to happen, but I thought, of course, it's a natural, you know, story. Um, and then, you know, the other one was basically, um, you know, he is the one that worked most closely with the dogs, uh, the first uh, hunter. Now, in terms of sequencing, the other thing we have to remember is 
it has to be logical in the sense that, you know, each person when they're introduced, you also propel the story visually in a sequence. So one, even though it wasn't shot that way, but when you're building it. So you don't go pack the house with one hunter and then skip to a, you know, a later part of the sequence or start with the guy already on the ice, you know. It's one guy packs, introduces the dogs, they take off. Another one is on the sled, you know, and he's already on the ice. And the third one, and it's all very much thought out, right? But you don't, you know, some of it you do in the edit room, some of it you do in advance. You know, the more you can think about things structurally, uh, the better the film will be. But you also should be flexible, you know, to adapt to what you find in the field. Um, the other um, bigger question then would be, uh, how do you do a three-part structure? Why? How, how do you do a arc of the story, right? So in this case, it's almost almost like, you know, split for you very easily to understand the three parts. But anybody wanna? sort of take a guess on what is the three-part structure here in this film? Yes, but in th beside, <laughs> do you mind if I take some water or coffee or something to drink? A glass of water would be great. If somebody could bring me one. Um, go ahead, yes. I just find it maybe a different view of the question you want to hear. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for me, Greenland is all our Earth. It's all our planet. Uh, and our planet is uh, melt, uh, melt ice. Melting. Yeah. Second uh, symbolic, uh, it's all people in your movies. It's uh, all seven billion population of the Earth. And they're thinking way how they live today and uh, what they think about uh, their land. And uh, third, it's a uh, seal. Seal, it's uh, animals, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, resources which we use, which we eat. And uh, fourth, it's uh, dogs, it's uh, home animals which, uh, which we use and which we uh, cooperate or how we, uh, how we care about them or not. And fourth, Generation. It was very short sentence, but it was very important sentence. How uh, Hunter was uh, saying about the future generation, they should to learn how to adapt in current and future life. That's five uh, best ideas. Thank you very much. Yeah. No. Thank you for that. And and these would be what I would say are the big themes of, of the film. And, and I'm glad you found more than I even knew, which is good. <laughs> Go ahead, Bogdan. Um, I, I thought, like, uh, I wonder if you planned this. But uh, for me, the, 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 the greatest part, one of the best parts of the film was when the narrator pulls it all together and when he says, these people are the, the are the canary in the mine. Uh, that's uh, uh, I mean that's one hell of a very short way of saying that all of this is important, not just because these are kind of funny people and they're curious, but uh, did you did you plan to have him say something along those lines? Well, what you do is, you know, I had by by this point I had you know spent a lot of time with them. So I don't remember exactly if that was the first time he said it. I doubt it, you know. And so my job as a producer, I'm not on camera or director. I'm, you know, if, if I don't hear that said, I, uh, you know, I can, if, if there is a correspondent with me, I, I, it's my job to, to give that to her, you know, on paper and say, ask him about this, ask him about that. So I think that's clearly an important, you know, idea and it represents um, the film, therefore, has a bigger message than just. Uh, yes, yes. Um, anybody else in terms of 
because um, I'll move on to the next one. But in terms of structure also, um, when you're like a film student or if you're making films, right? So you have to look at things, not just from that kind of big picture, which is very important because that's, you're the audience, you're a public audience, and that's what you should take away from the film, right? But for us, if we're put, putting this together, so what are we thinking about, you know, in terms of structure when we're putting it together? So the first third, you know, the open was we capture, we capture the audience, you know, and that was, you know, that the, the great shot of them just taking off and that sound of the jet, you know, it's, and it's just the sled going through the ice. And right away, you know, we're, we're capturing people with, you know, our best moment. Then there was like a, a paragraph that this does, uh, talked about the North Pole exploration because these villagers were involved in that. A lot of them were even, you know, sons of, you know, grand, great grandsons of Perry, I think some of them. Um, but um, once we take off, we do the introduction of the characters and then um, we build, you know, to, uh, there's a very strange moment when you realize that the world is upside down, right? And that's when the, for me, the film then starts to, you know, th that surprise when they're pulling the, the motorboats, right? It starts to be more than just a travelogue, it's actually you know, trying to look at the absurdity of what, you know, has been created environmentally. But then we leave them, you know, at, the, at, at that last campsite with a big question, you know, and that's like, so you've done the setup, you've set up the characters, and you've, you've you know, you've left a big question, you know, for the viewers, right? Um, structurally, the second piece is, um, you have the big question, will they survive? In other words, will they kill a seal? Because that's all the dogs eat. They don't uh, eat, they don't take, you know, dog food with them. And if they don't eat, there's no way they're going to make it back, right? Um, so that is the second part was the, the resolution, the rising tension. And then eventually, the, at the end of Act 2, we have the breakup of the ice, right? Um, that scene happened in real life in 15 minutes, right? Um, and it's something that, you know, they basically, everything was calm and quiet for many days, you know? And then all of a sudden, 15 minutes, they say, we, you got to pack, we're going. If you're not ready, we're going anyway, you know? So, uh, because everything was about to fall into the water, you know, their, all their equipment and all their, their whole camp, you know? So, um, that propelled the final scene, which was resolving all the issues, right? So in the final scene, you have to explain, you know, all, all the questions you raised, right? So that would be, you know, both, um, you know, the climate change issues, but each individual story, you know, the, um, the story of, you know, the next generation, you know, what do the dogs represent? You know, there's a positive, you know, view on, you know, the future. Um, but it's also, we have to explain, uh, you know, these are hunters who are failing, uh, so why aren't they starving, right? So what, what is the role of, of, the, of the woman in the equation, right? Uh, the fact is in Greenland, it's a welfare state, you know, and people are supported by the state, you know, so women tend to have jobs in town, you know, in the library and, and everybody in Greenland is subsidized, you know? So, you know, to, to the tune of something like $30,000 per person, right? So the traditional life is ending, but it's not like people are starving, right? So you have to explain that just by that little scene, you know, with the women. And then there's the scene with the grandfather, right? So um, that's the last question. Uh, it, was it important to, sh wh why, why was it important to show his death? You know, does that, it wasn't part of, the hunt, but what, what did that represent to you as a viewer? True, but why focus on, uh, on his death? It's like a metaphor for the death of a way of life, really, right? Um, and, you know, it's, it's a sad moment, but it, it's just an emotional moment, right? So sometimes you're just playing with emotions, you know. But yes, there is that uh, theoretical aspect as well. Um, so, I mean, that's just kind of in a nutshell, this first movie. 
Um, anybody else want to ask anything else about this film? Uh, you know, go ahead. Why did I go to the scene? Yeah, why did you like leave it in the movie? Isn't it one of the reasons why it wasn't like shown on the? Well, because it was, it was never intended to be shown on network TV because it was, you know, it was always intended to be on the website, you know. Um, yes, yeah, so you can't show blood, you know, pouring out on the ice and, and the sensitivity of, of that would probably, that yeah, would just have to cut it down, you know. Um, but, you know, I think it's part of their culture. I mean, if you're doing hunting, it seems like, you know, you got to show a hunt, you know. And even though it was only one that we showed, and even though it wasn't successful otherwise, you know, it was important, you know, to, to show that, you know, as part of the film. Yeah. Uh, well, the whole ex trip was one go, but it was, I think, five to seven days we were out there, you know. So we never went back. You know, we were sleeping out. You, the way they sleep is you put two sleds together and then they put, you know, polar bear skin on top of that. And then they have a little tent on top of that. Uh, and then you crawl into a very warm sleeping bag, you know. <laughs> the, the problem for us is that we have to also charge batteries. So we have to, you know, like get up every two hours and me and the cameraman taking turns like, okay, you know, you got to feed the generator, change the batteries, you know. So there's a lot of this kind of practical stuff going on at the same time too. Okay. So um, do you have any other questions? Okay. So the other film I'm going to show you is, it's part of a series. So what, what I did in Kenya, basically, um, and uh, it's called Giving Nature a Voice, right? So when I, when I came to Kenya, uh, I didn't really have a specific mission, uh, but shortly after I had done one or two courses with like the local TV stations, um, the, the dean, uh, they had received a major grant from an environmental organization to uh, do uh, reporting, uh, to try to do a higher level of environmental reporting for TV, right? And it was totally undefined, you know, uh, which doesn't usually happen, you know, where you have a chunk of money and then you have to define the program. It's usually the other way around. And, but in this case, uh, my, my feeling was that, you know, we were gonna reach out to the young and filmmaker community to produce films on environmental subjects uh, because the local TV stations uh, in Kenya were just focused on the election, on politics, and it was impossible to get reporters to go out, you know, and spend a month or two on a story, right? So we organized uh, uh, something called Giving Nature a Voice, just me and uh, an assistant, uh, where we asked young filmmakers to send in proposals, and we uh, received, you know, maybe three times as many proposals as we could fund in the first cycle. Um, and they would be all on different uh, environmental issues in East Africa, in the six countries of East Africa, plus Congo. Um, and so in the first season, this is one that I'm going to show you a film that um, was made by a young uh, African uh, investigative reporter. So I was the executive producer on the, on the show, not like the, the producer. But I was, I did go out on the first shoot so I can tell you exactly what, what it was like and so on. But the idea was that uh, he came to us and he was one of the first people that came to us. And he, and he said uh, that in Kenya, you know, most people don't realize that there are many more people killed every year by uh, uh, intertribal conflict than by uh, terrorism from Islamic radicalism, right? And this is uh, very much um, fueled also by climate change, right? Um, so he said that he wants to follow, um, without knowing what was gonna happen in the next year, uh, he was gonna follow the, uh, the program, I mean, the, the migration of cattle in areas where there's a lot of conflict and where uh, pasture land is drying up and so on. So initially I wasn't gonna show this film, but after speaking to uh, some of your, my colleagues here, they said this is something that would be very uh, relatable to 
to an uh, audience here in Bishkek. But first I'll play you the promo uh, for our series uh, that uh, was, because it aired on a national TV channel called NTV. So this is number two, this is a two minute promo uh, for the whole series. And then afterwards I'll, we'll, we'll play the third section of a four part series called End of the River, okay? So I find the park uh, amazing. It's one of the few places I've been to where you really feel how big the world can be and how small a human is. East Africa, home to some of the world's most spectacular wildlife. Even today, the fish eagle numbers are just still amazing. If we have a healthy coral reef, then uh, the seagrass around will be healthy. But now, Mother Africa is in big trouble. Poachers have killed thousands of our elephants and rhinos. Snares have crippled our chimpanzees. Developers are blocking wildlife from freely migrating. Seas are now choked with plastic. Raw sewage is released directly into our coastal waters. Rainforests are burning just to make charcoal. Climate change is melting once mighty glaciers. Drought is desiccating our grasslands. And when the water dries up, people and wildlife fight for scarce resources. But now, many here are trying to reverse this dangerous trajectory. Join us on an extraordinary journey with young African filmmakers as they strive to give nature a voice. Help us work towards saving our precious wildlife and priceless homeland. Part three of End of the River, which was a four part uh, a four part series uh, shot over the course of a year uh, looking at the effect of drought on competition for scarce uh, resources, pasture land, and relation and what that caused in terms of tribal conflict. Okay, so we can uh, air part three and uh, then we can talk about it as well. So. My name is John Alanam. I'm a Kenyan investigative reporter, and I'm on a journey. Yes, I'm a I'm a The volumes of the Wasanjiro River over the years has been actually going down. They come down from north, they come from all directions yes. to exploit those resources. Around here. This is recurrent now. They want this war not to end. This conflict to go, go on. These tens and hundreds of cattle being driven across the plains have been on a very long and desperate journey and they're being driven up towards the Abadea Ranges and Mount Kenya. They are going into reserve the areas much more earlier than the normal times. We are seeing that there will be a likelihood of um, resource-based conflict.
Mtu unafikiria tu hata unafikiria hata ukufi, heri ukufi ubadili ngombe yote imalise juu. Sasa ukiona hiki angazi kile inaendelea, alafu tena serikali inakusindikishia iishe. Hata unaona hata heri hata ukufi. The police are trying to restore law and order. People have property, people have boundaries. And that needs to be respected whether it's a Kikuyu, a Tugan, a Turkana, a Mzungu, a Samburu, a Pokot. You have your land and, and you have a right to protection of your land. By the end of 2017, Laikipia County, a region in Kenya well known for its great biodiversity, had been gazetted as a dangerous zone by the country's Ministry of Interior. 30 people, including six police officers from Kenya's best trained paramilitary unit, had been killed there in violence. The world's attention had been turned there after the deaths of a prominent British national and attacks on foreign-owned ranches. But local eyes had been turned to Laikipia long before. Mahali hawa ngombe wametoka. Ngombe hawa wametoka zehemu mingi nchini Kenya hii. Kuna ngombe kutoka West Pokot. Kuna ngombe kutoka Silale. Kuna ngombe kutoka Amaya. Kuna ngombe kutoka Samburu East, Wamba. Kuna ngombe hata zimetoka shini ya Mara Laluhuko. Kuna ngombe zimetoka Sukuroi, upande ya Laikipia na Nyuki. Na sote zimesanyika hapa. Na hawa kusanyika hapa kwa sababu wamependa kukusanyikia hapa. Wamesanyika hapa kwa sababu ya kiangazi. So this is where they are coming in from? They are coming from there. Yeah. The others are invading from this. This is Mugi, they are invading from this side. From Samburu. Others from Pokots, from this side. Yeah. And then the other Samburus are invading from Isiolo. From Isiolo. Coming no. towards... Uh, the north. Yeah. But why was this such a violent time? And why was most of the violence concentrated in just one county? Josh Perret manages the 30,000-acre Mugi Ranch, a sprawling savanna teeming with wildlife. But in January, carcasses began dotting the plains here. 30 kilometers of the ranch's fence line had been destroyed, allowing thousands of cattle coming in from the east to cross into the ranch. There was a lot of grass. There was, I mean, this whole area, there was, I mean, grass about half a meter tall, all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. And these cattle that we're seeing here, they're, they're not from your farm, is it? No. From your ranch? These are cattle from, uh, generally Pakot, yeah. um, various parts of Pakot, all, all the way down into the Rift Valley, Carpedo, Ginyang, yeah. all those, you hear Los Yolo, which is I guess more Samburu. Yeah. Mugi Ranch is in the northwest corner of Laikipia County, sitting on the border with Baringo County, home to the Pakot community. Your fence lines of course are broken. Um, yeah. <laughs> seem like a, this is, I don't of know. Course we saw the pump and, and the buffalo. Yeah. Is, yeah. This, is this something that happens every time uh, grass is needed from your ranch? No, we, our immediate neighbors we've been working very, with, very, very well with yeah. over the past years. Um, a lot of what's going on here are people from further afield. They're not our immediate neighbors. Yeah. So a lot of this destruction, uh, it's, it's something that is to be questioned why. There's got to be some other motive behind it. The pastoralists didn't just break through to have their cattle graze. Millions of shillings worth of damage, bullet-riddled houses and vehicles were left in their wake. So were the carcasses of elephants and buffaloes. We've really lost a lot of animals uh, because uh, the bigger number is what we don't see because we have hyenas and vultures around. So the bigger number is what we don't see. But uh, we, have, we have managed to see nine elephants. Uh, we have like um, a over 15 buffaloes killed right away. 
but still a lot of them are dying because of severe injuries that they, uh, they have. And also we have like four giraffes. Uh, the most painful one was a giraffe that was uh, killed, a pregnant giraffe. There has to be someone behind it. You don't get incredibly well-armed people with a bottomless supply of bullets. The pastoralists moved south of Mugi Ranch to Kifuku Ranch. Marie Dodds, the owner of Kifuku Ranch, had to graze her cattle inside her home compound. Like Mugi Ranch, the intensity with which pastoralists hit Kifuku was unprecedented. The crazy thing is, is here we are living on a farm and this is how you feed your cows. They are in this enclosure every single day for 24 hours a day. Um, they don't leave um, and the hay, you know, you buy in the hay to feed them. Dio mwezangu nikaja tukatoka. Mimi nikafunga nikafunga nyumba. Nikaambia fuata mimi. Tukaenda naye hapo hivi. Nikarukia pale hivi. Kwaenda kufika pale nikaambia tupike kama nini hii. Akasema na nyinyi kabila gani? Mwezangu akaambia sisi ni pokote. Wakaangaliana na mna hivi wakaangaliana hakuongea. Akadiba basi rukeni. Tukaruka tuka, sasa tukaenda. Baada ya kufika kama saa nane, dio moto ikalupuka hapa. Kwangu ni nyumba ilikuwa hii nyumba ya katikati hii. Hizi ni kijiko. Nyumba ikalipuka ndio nirudi kaambiwa nyumba yenu hakuna kitu. This undated amateur video shows what seems to be a graduation ceremony of Pokot warriors. Armed to the teeth and very well trained and coordinated, Pokot warriors were brazen in how directly they faced off against the police or anyone who crossed their path. South of Mugi Ranch, yet more murders would be attributed to them. On March the 3rd, Tristan Vosboy, the majority shareholder of Sosian Ranch, got word that three of the cottages on his ranch had been burnt. He would visit the ranch two days later and go out on horseback to assess the damage. He met those responsible for it and was shot to death. It took the police a full day to recover his body because of how insecure the area was. Up next, we go to the ranch on which he died, finding it still occupied by Pokot herders, and speak to the man in the eye of the storm of violence in Laikipia. My people have been living in this land for more than 30 years. Two weeks after rancher Tristan Vosboy's death, we visited Saucian Ranch. Not only were there signs of the gun battles that took place here still evident, but dozens of Pokot herders were there as well. So were thousands of cattle that they owned. The herders allowed us to get up close and film with them. Now it was from this perch where tourists, guests of the Sosian Ranch, would come and watch wild animals drink water in the heat of the middle of the day or at dusk. And in fact, just above the ridge over here is where Tristan Vospoi was killed. But now this perch is well and truly in control of the Pokot and they come to watch their cattle drink here now. And those cattle are in their thousands, I can tell you. But the surprising thing isn't just the number of cattle, but the sheer number of the Pokot here as well. The herders were armed, but with spears and sticks, at least on camera. They claimed that they didn't have any guns, but with such large herds to protect, that would be unlikely. I spoke to Lopokuyang Losire, one of the more senior members of this group of herders, first about the reputation of the Pokot, and then the claims that from their community were those who were responsible for the murder of Tristan Vospoi, responsible for violence and damage across Laikipia. Apo, pengine tu alienda kukutana na mauti kiajali. Ni msoso tuwezi za... Tuseme 
nyasi ama kitu kama maji the herders knew that they were on private land illegally but they said the push to keep their cattle alive overwhelmed them the herds were massive but by this time of year march 2017 these cattle had not seen good pasture for a good long time so even when new lives were added to their numbers certainty of their survival was slim kenya ina sababisha tuseme ni sio rasimali sio hii si mfuko lishe ju sina mali wa kufukia yani sina shamba ngo binafsi ni yani kikauka ninaenda kutafuta malisho kwingine kama ni maji ninaenda kwa wenyewe pengine asijaomba na hiyo ndio ilikuwa analeta mzozo ndio kama tuseme area tuko sasa ni bwana mtu kwa sababu una lingine unaingilia tu kwa sababu ya shida unaona ngombe imeanguka na hiyo ndio tegemeo yako na unajua una una lingine the fact is that lakipia was always one of the the grass bank areas for the pastoral communities they either moved northeast or they moved up onto the lakipia plateau so what we're seeing happening is an example of human population expansion insufficient resources and that human population moving into other areas where they see resources available those other areas are already occupied by people and we're seeing conflict as a result of that and that is going to continue there there has to be some solution both lopoku young and hydrologist dr sean avery are right the drought pushed communities further and further into Laikipia. But it wasn't just in Laikipia where this was happening. At the same time, east of Laikipia in Isiolo, where we first started this journey, the Iwaso Nyiro that feeds many of the counties here was drier than it should have been at this time of year. The group of Samburu herders that we first met in September 2016 had pushed north into the territory of the Borana community. It all came to a head in Com, in the north of Isiolo. But it isn't just drought that had driven the Pokot and other communities into Laikipia. Since we last saw them, the Lashakwet family's cows are looking as healthy as they were, although they should have been healthier had the short rains fallen as they should have and on time. The Samburus and the Boranas are all converging on the last few patches of grassland here, and that's going to cause conflict. To me, the driver behind all this has been the loss of grazing, the loss of grazing further north, and, and I'm talking about parts of Isiolo and Samburu counties because drought is a cyclic thing in this part. It's not new. This is not the first drought, it won't be the last. And um, dry seasons come every year. So the, the, the perfect storm happened last year because drought, drought combined with the loss of, a set, they reach a certain threshold of loss of grazing land combined with the political season that 2017 was in Kenya, sort of ignited, ignited this. This is a government land, is a holding ground, and I'm really shocked. A government who has Dumbo standards. His Excellency the President announced that we have, drought has become a national disaster. And these people are just running here to, to survive because of the drought. These people are not getting food. Now the former Laikipia North Member of Parliament, Matthew Lempokel was to many a rancher and to the government the ogre in this conflict. Who specifically has told people to go and invade ranches? There are quite a number of them. Denying, yeah. Why are they denying it and some of them have already been arraigned in court? Are you referring to Lempoke? Among others. Is one of them among others. But to some herders, he was a hero. 
Lemburkel ni ana ni Lemburkel ni moto ana laume watu na tu, atuelewe ni serikali ana gani hiyo hata tunasikia kwamba Lemburkel ana sikaga wa mauaji unashangaa Lemburkel amekuja lini achukue bunduki ari na apigane Lemburkel atujawai hata na mimi nasema sijawai sikia mkutano mbaya nasema muende mwingie yani mwingie yani mashamba watu tuseme akikataa kwamba kuwa ngombe ama kufanya kushika watu bila atia. Pengine hiyo ndio wengine wanachukua. Na ile kipi kuna siasa mbaya. Kuna jamii tofauti tofauti. Wanachukua neno nyingine wanaenda kukanusha. Na watafuti yale mazuri anatafuta yale mabaya. People entered there because of the drought. But the land owners used because they are rich, they have been there, some of them uh, Uh, one choppers, some of them have a, lo a lot of money. They use the, the police. And when the police were moving out, they use excess, uh, excess force. Yeah. They provoke the situation. And now, they, after provoking the situation, by killing people, taking the people animals, because the police were coming and see the fattest bull, they put to, the, to their lorries, go and eat them. The same things apply to the fat goats put in the lorries. So when, uh, and you know for sure, also these people want the illegal firearms. So out of that anchor, that provocation, they retaliate. Some of them even banned, banned the lodges. The killing of 10 police officers on a ranch in Laikipia was one of the turning points in the conflict. But the former member of parliament was clear on this as well. If they were killed in the ranch, this means that they are provoked. Because if they have killed your cows, what next? If they have killed your people, what next? And you have illegal firearms. So then in that yeah. case, are the people who killed them criminals or are they just provoked? Were, I think that there are people who have been provoked. So they're because, not criminals? They are not criminals because if, you have your gun to pro if the government is not protecting you and you have your gun to protect your animals and the police comes there and kill your animals, kill your people, you can't see your life will just washed. With tensions rising over national politics and a security situation seemingly spiraling out of control, the government deployed the military to Laikipia in April, allegedly to hunt for the raiders who were running amok. The result was catastrophic for hundreds of herders caught in between. <laughs> chukao walikuwa na vitu viwili tu walikuwa wanatafuta walikuwa wanatafuta ngombe na mtu chukao wenye walitorokea pale shini wakionekana kidogo hiyo kifaru inaenda upande hiyo na ilikuwa ina, ilikuwa ina mwogo risasi mpaka hata sitokashangani ndio endelea sasa ngombe zilisanyika pale walirushia bomu moja in Laikipia as well as in the counties surrounding it hundreds of cattle the only source of livelihood for the pastoralists in these areas were mowed down by government bullets. The government made little effort to distinguish herder from criminal. These are people who have come to settle in somebody's farm. Mm. They, they put up structures mm -hmm. and they don't want to move out peacefully. They don't want. Mm. Yes. So the police are just utilizing a bit of some minimum force to, 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 to affect these fellows. Yes. But would you consider this kind of action lawful? We, you need to get to the commander and find out because there is an operational commander who is in charge. Mm. Yes. No, I'm just saying operationally, would mm. it be lawful for cattle to be shot and... Maybe, maybe un unless they were caught in the crossfire. You, you see what, what I was saying, some of these armed militias, mm. they hide amongst the animals, inside the animals. Mm. That's where and they, they start shooting at the police. Mm. Yes, unless it is a scenario like that. Because I don't think whether the police will just go around shooting animals without any, any provocation. Bitterness against the government smoldered in almost every affected person we met. Kuna nyo umetoroka kabisa wa mpita wanasema tunaenda mwa mpikena. Sala sisi file tulifikia hii mtu uwaso, tuliona kama hii mwambe ya hivisi fika uko. Tukamua tukurudi, kama watuturudia, waturudia tu wa tumalisi safari moja. But the violence raged on. And just as it started in January, 
with the carcasses of wildlife dotting Lycipia's sparse landscape. It continued, this time with the animals of herders lying dead on that same ground. In the final episode of The End of the River, how easy is it to keep a 100,000 acre piece of land without people invading it? We look into the revenge attacks that took place in Laikipia County. Wakafuja pia, wakaterrorize watoto. Ile jida inaonekana kwa mtu analisha ngombe mi elfu tatu, kuna mahali ya kuchunga unapereka wapi. And ask the deeper questions about what really was at the source of this conflict. This piece of land is on the boundary between the, the region of East Pokot and Laikipia. And there is something which is called expansionism. And how is what we saw connected to the drying up of the once mighty Iwaso Nyiro River? We're headed down to Majianyoka, and to be honest, I'm a little nervous because we don't know how close or how far the, the raiders are, and it's dust right now. very intense this story but it's maybe something that you can uh, I can explain more of the background if you have questions because this is you're seeing part three of a four-part series but uh, does anybody have any questions first about what you saw and then I can explain about the the whole series and and uh, thank you and what was the intent of it so any questions Uh, do you have the same kind of land conflict here that between environment, the relationship between environment and uh, between communities as the environment is stress? Right. So do you have a question? Yeah, I had a question. So who was the intended audience for this uh, four part series? Well, the, the whole Giving Nature Voice series aired on NTV, which is one of the three national channels in, in Kenya, right? But it was something that we produced through the Giving Nature Voice program, which was a part of the Aga Khan University. Um, but uh, we had a weekly show every Sunday. So we, there's 52 episodes. So if you, uh, that's what the promo was on that. So we done everything from uh, human wildlife conflict to extinction of species to raw sewage being spilled into waters to burning of rainforests and and also you know the solutions in in some of the sections as well but this was the most dramatic story by far um, and this happened because uh, there was the worst drought in 60 years in Kenya the, that uh, that year and that filmmaker came to us before the drought, right? So the idea was he, he came to me and said, look, I, I'd just like to follow four or five of these tribes, you know, who are always in conflict, you know, and, and see what happens. But as often in, in you know, good investigations and, and documentaries, it's the actual events take over. Um, and this became, you know, the, the most violent year uh, in Kenya in many years because it was the worst drought in many years. And, and people were, uh, all these Northern tribes who still live a pastoral lifestyle uh, were going South, you know, because their land had turned, you know, to desert, right? And so they were not only fighting amongst themselves, they were fighting against ranchers, as you saw, against conservancies, wildlife protection areas. Um, and then the government in reaction to it you know, came down with a fist, as you saw, and, and uh, many people were killed and much, you know, damage was done to, you know, the communities, the wildlife, and to the cattle, of course, too. Uh, I mean, two reasons why I ask. A, it's, it leaves you with a lot of questions, including those about, uh, you know, land rights of the local people versus the ranchers who almost exclusively were 
uh, 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 you know, people from the West. But there are questions which I believe uh, do get answered either before this episode or later, right? Right. It's a little bit, you know, in the middle of a series. Of course. Um, and, um, you know, I could easily pick one uh, documentary that is more complete. But I, I thought that this is something that when people had mentioned, because the idea is, you know, what if we're going to look at Central Asia in the same manner, if there are, you know, funds to, to do a documentary, thank you, a, a series here, um, what kind of issues would you expect to, to look at, right? So if, if we could organize the funds to, to do a documentary series, I would imagine that the struggle over land, maybe it's not as violent, but it would be one of the issues, you know, as, you know, glaciers melt, um, what happens to pasture land and what happens to the communities who have to fight over a scarce and more and more scarce resource, right? Um, anybody else have a question or comment on that? Yeah. Yes, as we discussed, uh, the purpose of your visit to Central Asia is to, you know, to study the impact of climate change on people's livelihoods and on the, on the impact on, on nature. So how important for you to shoot such, you know, dramatic stories? I mean, if you are here to look for such similar dramatic stories in Central Asia, I don't think you will find such, you know, <laughs> sure. events, maybe in the past, historically, yes, you will find uh, dramatic stories, but currently, I don't think, uh, I don't know, but maybe you'll have to talk to people or we haven't really, there are many stories, but if the purpose is to have an impact, like a strong impact on the audiences by presenting such, you know, violent cases, I mean, that's what I want. Maybe you can, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so why don't you go ahead. What, what? Yes, uh, so if to talk about the topics, uh, one of uh, my friends, she's an activist, and recently, uh, maybe you heard about that, we have air pollution problem, not only in Kyrgyzstan, but also in Central Asia. And uh, she just started to make this documentary film, how does uh, air pollution influences on the people, because uh, people live near the areas where they burn everything that really influences on the health. But it's also a question how to uh, prove that uh, health issues are uh, because of the air pollution. So there are a lot of questions right now that uh, she's facing with. Uh, and it would be great if uh, you could guide or uh, help uh, with this topic. And... Um, Another uh, topic that uh, you asked about, uh, so um, her uh, aunt, uh, she bought many years ago a land from one woman uh, who was selling uh, in one village uh, the land places. And it turned out that uh, it, she made it illegally and already for one year they're fighting with the government with the law in order to prove that she just uh, made it illegally and today they went for a meeting in front of the uh, law court uh, to talk about uh, this topic because uh, the government doesn't want to do something and this woman she's very uh, rich and that is why people just um, close their eyes and usual people are struggling because there is some um, a company who started to build uh, on this territory because they illegally bought it but people still live there so um, and there are many many other topics uh, with uh, real history problems which we have here and uh, it's great to see how you um, cover and how you show these uh, questions. And I also had a question, um, how influenced these films on the people who watched them uh, in Kenya and whether there was a uh, future, some um, works with the government and how they okay. did and it. Thank yeah, you. so in terms of answering your point, um, you know, you know, most stories are, are not as dramatic, you know, with life and death consequences. And that doesn't mean, 
you know, they're not real conflicts going on, as you mentioned. Uh, I don't know what your name is, sorry. Nelly. Nave? Nelly. Um, they're, you know, the conflicts are below the surface, you know, um, and, but they're just as personal, just as real. Uh, it just means that you, you have to follow it, you know, more artfully and over time, you know, and um, that's, you know, 99% of the films that we did were more in that kind of pace, you know, um, where you're exploring, you know, an issue, you know, like, like a water pollution issue, air pollution issue. But to do a, you know, a documentary, you, you follow it over time and you develop, you know, like, like you said, that there's an activist, there's a character, there's a conflict that exists because, you know, there's a opposing points of view. There's also the conflict that exists because the environment itself, you know, is under threat. And, and all these are, are, you know, legitimate stories and, and really they would probably you know, be more impactful. You don't create something that doesn't exist. In other words, John Allen Namu had no idea that, that we were gonna have the most violent year in Kenya's history in many decades because of the drought, right? But once it was happening, what he was able to do was go there like every two, three weeks. And, and you just saw one community, but there were four or five different tribes that are followed in this film, you know? And, 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 and all the issues are, are explored through the eyes of that migration of cattle, right? So um, you just, you, you pick, you know, the structure you need to tell each story, right? So the idea here is, okay, so what we did at, at Giving Nature a Voice was, you know, basically to give a voice to the young African filmmakers, right? Because, you know, very often like, Western news media and documentary filmmakers, they have traditionally gone to Africa to find beautiful pictures of wildlife. Um, they've taken those images back home and they've done wonderful films, you know, they're on nature and so on. And it's only recently that people are speaking about, well, wait a minute, these are biospheres that are disappearing and so on. So there's always been that kind of detachment, right? Um, but when you take um, a story that is important to the local audience like here um, and you have a local filmmaker doing the film and he's talking to the local people you know they're the main stars in the film not like a western expert the people who are there were all in you know in the middle of this crisis you know whether they were ranchers or whether they were different tribe people um, and they were all kenyans i mean you know except for that one british rancher so um I think that, that that was, you know, what we tried to achieve. Now, did we have specific impact, right? So if you look, if you look on the givingnaturevoice.org, there's a website and there's like 52 promos and descriptions of all the shows. And in some of them, you know, we were able to, to be part of a campaign that changed a couple of things. So for instance, um, two years ago, or, Kenya was about to build the, the biggest coal-fired plant, uh, energy plant in, in Africa, just about. It was one, certainly the biggest in Kenya, would have, would have produced half of the carbon that the country emits, right? And um, it made absolutely no sense, you know, because they were putting it in a UNESCO heritage village close to the Somali border. Um, the coal was going to be shipped from South Africa. There was no power. The power would have had to have been huge power lines over the desert that would have been inefficient. Um, but it was, it was still happening, you know. And the reason was that, you know, there were Chinese companies involved. There was bribery involved, the Kenyan politicians, and so on and so on. So the local uh, community uh, organized something called Save Lamu, and, and they contacted, one of the people contacted us and said, you've got to come, you know, there's, uh, you know, the, ma the major media was not yet talking about it because of, it involved very powerful people, right? Um, and um, we did a half hour program on it. It's called the, uh, it's uh, the fight for power. And um, it was not the only thing that stopped it. But eventually the, the court ruled that the, they didn't file the proper EPA, you know, the environmental protection permits, right? So 
it, it, it was stopped, you know, and, and everybody kept telling us the whole time we were doing the film, there's no way you're going to stop this. There's too many important, powerful people involved in this. You will never stop this, you know. Uh, and it's not like, in, a, in essence, as a journalist, you're, you're not, it's not really your job to, to be an activist. But, you know, if you are giving voice to people who are, um, in effect, that's what you're doing. That's how you're going to be perceived, you know. But um, that was one example. The other example, uh, um, there was a Burundi filmmaker who did a, a thing, uh, a film on um, overfishing in Lake Victoria where the, in uh, Burundi where there was absolutely no regulation. And after the film, the parliament passed the law, you know, uh, putting in, um, you know, restrictions on, on catch and so on. Uh, we also were part of a uh, uh, Kenya has banned plastic bags, you know, much more progressive than the uh, United States. And here, you know, you don't, it's illegal to have plastic bags anywhere now. Um, and it's very serious. And, you know, it, the ban is working. And so we, at the, when the ban was uh, coming into place, we did a film called Plastics Are Forever. Um, and it was, again, it was Kenyan production uh, where they were filming on the coast, you know, the, the effects of, of, of the plastics on the marine life, but also local people, fishermen and communities who were trying to clean up, you know, the beaches, you know, because it was in their interest to, you know, financially for tourism, for fishing and so on. So, you know, I think that all these issues, I'm sure there are many issues, like you said, in Central Asia, right? Um, and all these issues can be, you know, tackled the, the challenge is how do you as a filmmaker uh, do them in terms that makes it accessible to the audience, right? Um, and, and that's what the program was all about. So um, the question is, can, can that be replicated here or in the Himalayas? And, and I'm here now just for the first time, you know, I mean, I've been here in Kyrgyzstan before, but on this, um, on this mission, uh, both here and then in Tajikistan and also in Pakistan to look at the whole issue of climate change uh, and environmental stories and to see if we can again support you know local filmmakers uh, people involved in the program to organize you know in effect it becomes a movement you know uh, whether you're not really an activist but by supporting this kind of discussion and supporting you know, young people who are interested in these topics, um, you do become part of it as well. Um, so I don't know what your feeling is, but at the end, you know, we'll certainly we should take everybody's names who is interested in, and as this goes on, we don't have funding yet for this, but I'm just exploring, you know, right now, uh, because films are made, you know, you need funds, you need support, you need equipment and so on. And um, that, that is what I'm hoping we can, we can do through the auspices of UCA and, and AKU as well. Um, any reaction to that question or whatever? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, it's, it's a related question to what you just mentioned. You, I think in the beginning you said that 50 years ago, documentaries were made in a different way. You, know, you yeah. would have a script, people would fit videos in it. That's changed over time, it's more uh, content driven and then you create stories around it. Now, I believe uh, you must be keeping a close eye on how attention spans are also evolving or devolving, if I may say so. Uh, anything more than a few seconds and you know, nowadays people talk about thumb stoppers. So do you think, because these ha are ultimately, they, they're likely there to, be, to make an impact, right? There is an audience who you're catering to uh, and the ultimate goal, especially the one you just showed, it, it, it's aimed at making an impact on ground. So I'm just wondering, uh, how are you evolving as a film uh, maker? How are you evolving or planning to evolve or, or is that something that you're not looking at right now? given the changing attention spans, the, given the change in which people are kind of bombarded with information and it becomes very difficult today to, to find what to look for. I mean, 50 years ago, one documentary is, it goes through the world and everyone gets to watch it, spend time at it, no distractions. Today, the distractions are so many. In two minutes, you will have three more things that are beeping on your phone. So yeah, I mean, how, yeah, there's definitely a, 
uh, two movements going on at the same time. So um, yes, uh, videos are getting shorter because people are accessing them on phones, you know? Um, and especially young people, um, you know, they are now working in formats like, you know, three minutes maximum, you know, three to five, six minutes, right? And a lot of the filmmakers that I would know in Kenya, they, that, that's how the, a lot of them, that's how they make their money too. They would be working on platform because it's a place that doesn't have a lot of regular jobs, you know? It's everybody's an entrepreneur, you know? Uh, and so part of the entrepreneurship is also, you know, to create your own little websites and to draw advertising. And advertising is drawn by a number of hits. And, and so, you know, I know people doing this, and, you know, in, including people who had made serious films for me, you know, with this program. Um, but at the same time, um, there's a, a new market through the streaming services. You know, never ever before has there been as many places to put a featured documentary, you know, an hour and a half documentary. Like, you know, yes, it's, it's very hard to get on those platforms like Netflix, like Disney, like Apple Plus, but they're all, they all need content, you know, and they're not looking for three minute videos, you know, they're looking for even higher level production than this. So for instance, if I was to do a project in the Himalayas, I would start right up from the top to, to do a 4K, you know, documentary, you know, just because that's the minimum gate, you know, for, for those streaming services now. And if you're gonna spend that kind of time, you know, you might as well be able to at least have, you know, that as an audience, because that's a, a way to get some real resources behind it. But it's difficult because you're competing, you know, every year there's one or two documentaries that breaks through and it's usually happenstance because they're following something that nobody could have predicted. I don't know how many of you saw the one about the Russian doping scandal. Did you see the film? It's on Netflix. Uh, it started out like a, a, a young man trying to like doing a super size me was the one about eating Big Macs and what happens, right? That was a documentary, right? Called uh, but he did a, another one where he was just going to take all the illegal doping and go on, on bicycle uh, competitions and see if anybody was going to catch him. And then uh, the, the scientist who was going to help him backed out and he uh, uh, got uh, wind of uh, a Russian uh, expert who said, oh, okay, I'll help you. And then that led to the revealing of the Russian doping scandal, right? And it was all by happenstance and it happened two or three years ago. If, I don't know how many people have seen it. So that kind of documentary, nobody could have predicted, you know, because it, it was just something incredible that happened as he was filming, right? And, and the best documentaries on Netflix tend to be that, you know, there's something that don't repeat. It's just such an incredible like movie that, you know, that you have to be, you know, it's like getting, you know, putting lightning, you know, in a bottle twice or something. But I, I do think, for instance, this series, um, you know, in Canada, uh, we're negotiating right now, there's, some, there's a streaming service called the Green Channel. They're gonna take all 52 documentaries, right? Uh, we had half of the shows were on another channel called Africa Channel, uh, which is for the African diaspora. Uh, you know, we had, you know, two seasons on Sky, you know, plus, you know, what NTV, and all this money is, it's just going back to, to make uh, more documentaries. You know, nobody, I don't, you know, get a cut of it or anybody, you know, it's just to keep the, the, um, the momentum going, you know? So any, any other questions? Well, uh, this is Yeah, no, if, uh, of course it's a real issue and I'm, I'm, I'm totally aware of it. Um, it was the same in Kenya. I mean, there are many journalists killed there, you know, as well. Um, mostly when they're investigating corruption, of course, you know. So, um, 
it's it's an issue, you know, and the, you know, it's it's not you don't want to encourage people to, you know, no story is worth your life, you know. Um, so you have to make an honest assessment of what the real conditions are, you know, and what the you know what what the possibilities are. And then the institution has to make those decisions as well, you know. Because every media company also makes those kind of judgments, but they have you know lawyers and they have support mechanisms and you know much more safety than like an independent filmmaker. You're basically on your own, and I know that because I've I've been there, you know. So in you know that that can you know be life threatening for sure, you know. Any anybody else? Yeah. Very much, and um, regarding uh, the issues that you have with storage, I believe um, Kirby Stein, which is a good example, uh, has numerous issues, and they're uh, likely to have uh, some representatives which are environmental, so it's not like a foundation, but yet they can have multiple sources uh, which are raising this uh, technical literature that you have, uh, which is, uh, let's say, uh, if you talk about small uh, which already represents that it is, um, we know where they uh, live. Uh, we know that uh, Central Asia is facing climate change uh, related issues. Another thing is uh, the pressure uh, uh, of failings, because as a legacy of Soviet Union, we have like, 92 failings throughout the country, and 28 of them are radioactive. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, since we're an upstream country, um, and um, our country is not, um, um, maybe doesn't have enough resources in order to solve that issue. Uh, as an upstream country, with uh, the climate change that we're facing, we have that danger coming issue. Water or other, uh, I mean, uh, it can actually cause a big uh, problem. Uh, yeah, these are all very good stories, yeah. Open. We have uh, towns which are like, um, where people moved away from those towns to get to a ghost town. And uh, indeed, uh, there, there are so many issues, and um, it is um, due to the due to many factors, which I think will be interesting to explore because the international community I think, is not paying enough attention, and they need to take care of the big problem, not only in the country, but throughout the region. And has anybody done an environmental? television documentary series that was on a national channel that, you know, that was on a, you know, public or private TV channel here? Yeah, and do you think that is possible here in terms of the market? Interest? Well, in other words, would the stations put it on? Is it something that is too sensitive, or can you get, can you do it in a country like you know Kyrgyzstan? Um, are there enough young people who are involved in production to to produce? So in this case, we you know I can once we get into details, I can say exactly how much it costs, how many people were involved, how you know how many teams we had to have, you know, because my my job was. To, to make the assignments, you know, to approve the stories, go out, you know, train some of the teams and then have them come back and with, you know, very often, you know, kind of material that didn't make sense and then help them get it to final structure and then put it on the air. Yeah, that was the yeah, same. Really yeah. yeah, in Kenya, it's the same. They they paid a minimal amount. Oh, they, I mean, that, that yeah, uh, and and the money had to come from outside foundations. You know, now now we're collecting more money once it's finished. You know, because we're getting it on international platforms. But initially, yeah, it has to be you know some kind of NGO type supported or UN or. Whatever that's the, the the question, and and that you know takes time to raise funds for that. Yeah, but it's good to know that the issues are here, the interest is here. I'm sure you know because 
when I was first went to Kenya, I, you know, I had no idea how many young people were involved in film and, and cause you know, any, you know, a 12 year old can fly a drone better than I can most of the time, you know? Um, and the same with, you know, new technology is so light and so, and every year it's getting better, you know, it's going to 4k, it's getting, you know, the technology is more accessible, but what young people don't necessarily have is storytelling, you know, skills, you know, how to make a story compelling, how to, you know, like we talked about in the first film, you know, how to structure it, how to bring it from beginning, middle to end to have an impact and keep an audience engaged, you know, because you can't put people to sleep, you know, even though you have the best of intentions, you're still, you know, it's still, you know, basically also has an entertainment value. It has to have a, a good, it has to be a good story well told, you know, basically. Can I add, uh, according to the young people, so uh, there, are there is interest from young people, especially filmmakers who are interested in documentary films, uh, but unfortunately we don't have much support uh, to them. So I think that uh, in terms of guidance, mentorship first, and um, the second financial uh, question. So if there will be some uh, help uh, in both of these spheres, so I think that there will be a group of really uh, interested in documentary film uh, making people who would really like to be there and support Yes. So maybe what I would suggest is also that we have a second screening. You know, I'm supposed to be here. I'm here in the Fulbright, you know, uh, until the 20th. I'll go, you know, to Narin in between. Uh, we should probably try to get a, a second screening with young filmmakers involved, right? If you or we have one or two other contacts that, that were suggested that people would organize, because that's the community that you have to work with, really. Um, and then um, you know, then we, we have to go back and see if we can raise the funds if we can create the structure and that might take months, you know, might take a year, you know, but as long as, you know, the people are there on the ground and, and the stories are there, I'm sure, you know, um, then it's possible. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? I think we're supposed to finish at six, but, um, I'm happy to take other questions or we can talk informally and make sure to leave your... Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's important to, to, to start, you know, networking and so that we can take it to the next stage, you know.